the uh, Westford Museum. My name is Linda Green and I'm the director and I, I, I welcome you all today. Uh, we are thrilled to have Jim Capera, our um, rock god. <laughs> He's been, we have been blessed to have this wonderful exhibit here since March and Jim has been here several times um, to uh, talk about the exhibit but this is his sort of his, his formal lecture. So I will uh, turn the program over to you, Jim. And uh, thank you very much for attending today. And I do thank you for your, your generous donations. Uh, the donations today go to the support of the uh, Westford Museum and Historical Society. And uh, Jim? Thank you. <laughs> so if, if anybody can't hear me or can't see if I'm holding something up, just feel free to holler. But I'm a little bit de uh, hard of hearing. I should have hearing aids, and I don't. So when it comes to questions, too, um, I'd like to, it's a small enough group, I'd love to be, to be interactive, but I'd like to get through the material and hold the questions. So if you feel you have something that's really germane uh, to the point that we're at, um, please feel free to ask uh, about it. So I'm going to give you a very quick brief overview of, of what is on display here. And, um, Certainly at the end of this, uh, take, take your time in looking. Um, but the, the, the main purpose of the exhibit was to talk about the four commercially mined minerals of southwestern New Hampshire. So mica is here, quartz, feldspar are kind of combined because they make uh, glass and pottery. And then barrel is the, the main purpose of today's lecture. So these four um, commercially mined minerals um, just to give it, to put it in perspective, I made I made a handout. Now, the other side is really going to be tough for some of you. I know there's a lot of information there, but the purpose of this is to show this little map saying here's Westford and here's Barrel Mountain, 72 miles. Okay, so it's like directly northwest. You can't be any more direct than than northwest, and probably only 65 miles. But it says it's an hour and 48 minutes uh, between Westford and South Ackworth. Now, <clears throat> on my map here, I, I circled an area just north of Keene, New Hampshire, okay? So uh, if, if everybody's not New Hampshire literate, you know, on this side just above Westford, we've got Nashua, Manchester, Concord, right going up 93. So over on the other side, uh, southwestern New Hampshire, Keene's your major city. Well, there's a big oval here. And this big oval represents the Keene uh, Pegmatite District. It never really went down in history as the mining district, but it should. Um, it deserves that place in history. And um, it, it certainly was driven underground um, in, in its knowledge uh, of this area based on what I'm about to tell you. So if you see this other bigger map that I have here, you can see how it blows up from the smaller map. Okay, so just a little area northwest of Keene, New Hampshire produces this map here. And um, probably the, the most important thing to, to uh, point out is uh, in this lower bottom uh, box, it says basically if you were to use the center of this map, the red circle, I have the red circle over here too, and you drew a uh, the circle around the circle at seven and a half miles radius, there would be over 100 mines and prospects. That's the mining district, okay? There's nothing else you can talk about it. Yeah, they you know, took out wood and uh, maple syrup and that sort of thing, but uh, this is uh, the, the key area. And so again, you have four towns in this uh, larger map. Gilsom to the south is just north of Keene, one town north of Keene. Marlow to the east uh, goes all the way over to Walpole to the west, but this is uh, map stops at Alstead, and then Ackworth would be the northernmost por portion of uh, this area. Now, to show how important this area was, during World War II, uh, the, the we were able to, uh, mica, mica is critical, and I'm not here to lecture on mica, but it's, it's right there in the case if you'd like to see a little bit more about it. But this is a blow up of the exact same area you were just looking at, and in a government document of hundreds of pages, 
The only thing printed with any color was this map. This was the number one place that the U.S. government wanted to go to extract mica for um, uh, numerous needs during World War II. And again, this ends just shy of the mountain we're talking about today, which is Barrel Mountain. That's just north of it. Um, a lot of people don't have no idea what Burrow Mountain looks like, but uh, so this picture up here, and then I, I blew the same picture up uh, back on my hand out here, and it's a very small geography, very very small. Uh, the picture, the, the the friend that took this picture from her land, she's on what's called Osgood Ledge. Osgood Ledge is 32 times the size of Burrow Mountain, and today there's five active mines on Osgood Ledge. But again, Burrow Mountain was just like a little knoll, but they found it in 1810 or started to mine it, and um, it's still giving up uh, its mysteries and new minerals, and I have some new mineral finds that I'm going to talk about. So. Uh, 1810 is when the Bowers family, and uh, they were written up as the Micah uh, pioneers, along with Ruggles, the Ruggles mine up in Grafton. But between Sam Ruggles and um, uh, James Bowers, who lived in Ackworth, they created the entire industry of Micah uh, for America. And New Hampshire supplied 80% of the Micah needs of America for the first hundred years. So in you know, other places now, we talk about New Mexico. And, but so again, excuse me, I wanted to bring it back out of the country. There always was um, India, Brazil, really cheap labor, huge mines, very little regulations. But what was happening at the beginning of World War II is that the German submarines were taking out the freighter ships that contained goods that we needed to win the war. So it escalated mica to um, the point where it, this became this area of mining became subsidized mining, meaning that they were uh, I have the exact numbers I'm going to make them up, but say we were paying two dollars and seventy five cents a ton from India for mica, we paid the keen miners twelve dollars and eighty five cents a ton. So, um, but that's what it costs to extract it with labor and everything in our area. So, but very critical again, um, and, and, I, and I hope I don't leave you hanging without answering what Mike is used for. So, um, all right, the other, the last piece on this front here is, so the mine started uh, by the Bowers in 1810. Well, they were written up um, in eight, uh, 1838. I'm just, I meant to open this up before I started, but if I have my page numbers right. This shows the, uh, the Bowers homes in South Ackworth, and then right after it, it has the interview, um, which I, I, I wanted to find the source of the interview, but um, I opened it up too late. Uh, I think it was something something along the lines of the Boston Globe. So not inconsequential, but also early in the days of mining in this particular area. So again, uh, the reason I'm talking about mica at this point is because from a historical standpoint, that was what brought the, the dynamite and the uh, uh, foreman and the companies to mine in this particular area. Um, I also don't want to forget to do this, so um, this is, now take fast forward from the Bowers family that I just spoke about to recent times, the ownership of Barrow Mountain um, has been owned by Carl Thomas and subsequently his descendants since the 1960s, so, excuse me, so for a good, um, it's almost 60 years now. Um, and it is, it is still in their family ownership. He donated everything that we're seeing that's on display here. 
And so the last thing I want to tell, tell, touch you about, touch on about the display is to thank Carl Thomas, and, and he was an amazing businessman um, and the owner of Barrel Mountain. Um, but his, his, the main job was in blasting. So in this case over here, just if you get a chance to look later, uh, we've got some of the oldest uh, blasting equipment with the, the wooden box with the plunger, wooden plunger, and you'll see a, a large piece of copper dead in, uh, that um, shorts out the device so that it can't discharge. Um, you know, this is the one where you know you touch it, you plunge it, you're dead. And we can kill 20 people at once, okay? So massive amount of capacitors, and capacitors are made with mica. The weight of, a, of, a, of some of these is, 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 is dependent upon the amount of mica in, in the capacitors. So then it goes to a, a red-handled uh, metal one, a detonator here. Um, this detonator, which uh, I believe has never been used, it's brand new and it's called a tunnel blaster, but this would be something set up uh, when they are going after um, copper ore or coal or something and going way into a, um, a mountain and um, they want to do all their blasting from a centralized box or their all the initiation from a box that can send the charges way down uh, hundreds and hundreds of feet into the mine and blast. So very unusual piece of equipment to uh, have been donated to my little mu museum. So anyway, um, and we got some hard hats, we've got some experimental drill bits here. That's really kind of cool to see. It's sitting next to a standard one inch, one and a quarter inch drill bit. Um, actually, they would drill the holes a little bit bigger than a stick of dynamite. Uh, I've got some simulated sticks in there and a couple other ones here that just wooden dowels painted red. Um, but basically, you want the hole to be bigger than the dynamite and, and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, detonating wires that you're using on it. So, <clears throat> that brings it up into modern times. Uh, the, um, so now I'm going to go back and tell you, uh, we're, we're going to skip talking about mica and, and other such things. I will just mention that I am wearing pieces of Burrow Mountain. Uh, this is Golden Barrel and it was faceted by me. I have a hunking piece of uh, barrel that I always put on when I'm lecturing about barrel. So blue green um, or sea foam green, uh, if you really want to see the nice sought after bluish barrel, it's right here in the front of the case. That's not local, it tells you it's from the National Defense Stockpile in uh, Pennsylvania. But anyway, uh, marketing tells us that the blue green is worth more than the green green or the seafoam green. But if you bring it back to the Egyptians, we all like the Egyptians. They reveled over the seafoam green more than the blue green. So if you want to be Egyptian-like, we can all just like, enjoy that color a bit more. Um, there are many different colors. Uh, again, I, I mentioned uh, the, th this is a golden barrel. Uh, both of these um, and golden barrel is um, it just got more iron in it than the than the uh, than the, the green or the blue green so um, and then also I brought just as an additional display item today the rose quartz well actually we've got it over here already um, there's a bunch of rose quartz I, I, uh, I thought I, I thought I didn't have that board but I do so um, all right this is, this is, we're gonna to switch to the other side of the board, okay? So for some of you, if you didn't do well in science, this is gonna be a little bit insulting, but I gotta bring it back down to the periodic table of elements <laughs> and, uh, and the universe. So, <clears throat> the scientists tell us that the universe is mostly made up of hydrogen, helium, and oxygen, and there's a teeny little sliver where everything else that's in the periodic table of elements exists. This, again, I think this new telescope's gonna help answer the questions, but um, supposedly after the Big Bang, or whatever initiated things, the four elemental elements are right here. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. And in the periodic table of contents, you know, the, 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 the hydrogen and helium are the two topmost ones, and then lithium and beryllium are right below uh, in the next row. So 
these are these are the smallest elements in the universe. Okay, um, and the periodic table of elements is set up measuring um, each one of the uh, elements by the number of neutrons within an element. I hope I got that right. Protons. Protons. It's one or the other. Protons. Okay. Protons? Yeah. All right. So let's reverse it and go back to a point in time, um, 1930. They know about protons, okay? So now we're looking at uh, this model of, of, a, of a, an atom, and they know about protons and the electrons. They don't know what else is there. They know something else is there, but they don't know. Well, having the extraction of beryllium as a metal, the elemental metal, from the mineral beryl, beryl, beryllium, they are named, uh, they are named that way. Um, and this is the hunk of beryl I was going to pick up. This is actually from the neighboring town of Alstead. It's not from Beryl Mountain, but it's a beautiful crystal. And um, it shows how it, it grows, always mixed right in with mica, quartz, feldspar. Um, so anyway, once they were able, it was a 200 year, 200 year pursuit to get beryllium out of barrel. So we knew about this uh, metal. We didn't know all that it could do, but uh, um, besides trying to turn base ingredients into gold, alchemy. The, 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 the sought after, after alchemist in the scientific world was beryllium. And so until they had the beryllium dust that extracted from a barrel crystal, and let's, the uh, statistics would be along this line, there's eight to 12% beryllium oxide within barrel, and that would lead to six to 8% pure beryllium metal. Now, I have a simulated jar of beryllium powder over here. It's just silver, like all the metals, okay? The only two metals that aren't silver in color are gold and copper, and we like them a lot for jewelry, right? So the silver metals, whoever really cared much about them? But <clears throat> being the holy grail it was, was because of its size, the smallness of, uh, of beryllium. So once they had beryllium powder to, powder to play with, um, and I'll just turn this around so I get the dates right, in 1931 was the discovery of the, the neutron because they had beryllium to help them figure it out. And it actually, it was so critical, it won the 1934 Nobel Prize. So, it's a contention of mine that beryl is the most important mineral of the 20th century that none of us know anything about. Before today, how many people, just if you don't mind raising your hands, know, knew about uh, just even the metal beryllium? Have you ever heard of it? All right, and that's probably why we're here. <laughs> so, that's good. It's a larger percentage of people than normal. But, um, but anyway, let's talk about how, how uh, critical it is with my last two scientific slides here. Um, so basically, having beryllium advanced the entire field of nuclear physicists, which is huge. And it put all of the elements, um, you know, they, 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 they now could decide what, what they didn't know about, the holes and where, what elements they could be looking for. So, um, this is, we're down here in this lower corner, this is Time Magazine's Top 20 Technological Advances of the 20th Century. It's their list, not my list. Beryllium was responsible for 90%, and yet we don't know about it, most of us. So 90% of the te top technological advances of the 20th century came about um, and the only two that are nixed on this uh, uh, today, an electric refrigerator or air conditioner is loaded, well not loaded, but it has beryllium in it. So anyway, extremely um, important, but it was, it was um, 
the reason we don't hear about pure beryllium is because it's always alloyed. It's always added to another metal. Okay. okay, so that's what's so important here, and that's what's shown in the case over here, is the copper beryllium alloys. Um, so another, another factor that um, made it so crucial is there's a lot of properties. It, it could dissipate heat, and then when you see the copper springs here in the case, or any time you've ever opened up a flashlight, there's the spring that's holding the uh, battery, uh, beryllium is what gives it the springiness. Without beryllium, it breaks. And I remember as a kid getting the Chinese or the Taiwanese knockoff, and the spring broke. They didn't know to use beryllium copper in the spring. Um, every single telephone connection, when you see the, the old RJ, you know, everything's wireless now, but when we had to plug things in, uh, all your 10 base T connections, those are all springy copper uh, pieces. That's only possible because of beryllium. Um, let me stay with this. The, the other thing that you can see in here is a uh, dental pick. So anybody that's ever had a dental pick in their mouth, it's made of beryllium nickel. It lasts, it keeps its um, uh, shape and sharpness for a much longer period of time. Uh, scalpels. Scalpels, many scalpels are a beryllium alloy to keep them sharp. Now, let's go back to this alloy and the smallest molecule. This one, I don't have a graphic, but so if you have ever seen um, the balls and straws of a molecule, so let's just pick copper, okay? And it's got all that space in it. Well, when you alloy beryllium, it's so small it fills in the holes. So 2% added to copper makes copper six times stronger. That's the whole secret to like the number one use of beryllium. Um, so it does the same when you alloy it with nickel or any of the other uh, ingredients. Every, every time you've ever filled up your gas tank, everything metal is a beryllium alloy. Okay, the metal in the car, the metal nozzle for the hose, because it's non-sparking. It wasn't until the 1930s that uh, non-sparking tools came about and made one particular company a mega millionaire, right? Big snap-on for the uh, tools. So uh, non-sparking tools, uh, the space hammer you hear about, you know, the $2,000 hammer versus like, why isn't it a drop forge? Well, it's non-sparking, it's beryllium. And beryllium in its purest, like, say you were making a hammer totally out of beryllium, it's like unheard of. But here's, here's, here's how we have to talk about how rare beryllium is. So, we talked that it was formed only in the Big Bang. The only thing since the Big Bang has been supernovas. And there's seven of those known in our neck of the woods that have made beryllium since the year, since Christ was born. So the last 2,000 years, only seven supernovas. That's the only thing that creates it. Now, if you went to a beach, the normal, um, uh, the, the grain of sands, you go to a beach, you hold a million grains of sand in your hand, if you could, um, only two to six of them are beryllium. That's how rare it is in the world. Now let's talk about mines. Um, mines that are mining pegmatite minerals. Pegmatite minerals is everything that we're talking about here was created by molten mag magma cooling, okay? So the molten magma comes up in the ground, it liquefies all the rock, and then it separates out into mica and quartz and feldspar and bar barrel and a host of other such minerals. Well, this is the state of New Hampshire statistics, and I'm going to extrapolate it to the world. They um, analyzed 161 pegmatite mines in the state of New Hampshire. They identified the government. These are, this is all in government documents. And everything I'm about to tell you that is earth shattering all comes from my research of government documents and seeing what they printed, what they admitted, and when did it come back in history? Because now I have the rear view mirror of hundreds of years of looking at this. So, um, 50% of the mines of New Hampshire in the discard piles, that's the tailing, so they're doing some kind of mining, pulling the stuff out of the earth, 50% of them showed zero barrel. 
and a little more than 50% showed, uh, showed barrel in the tailings pile. That extrapolates around the world, okay? Half of igneous mines in the world have zero barrel, and half have some barrel, depends on how much. Now, the government documents tell us that a mine that has 1% barrel, the actual term they use is unusually rich at 1%. The normal is 0.1%. So at 0.1 to 1%, the miners would have to mine 300,000 tons of hard rock, drill holes, explode it out, to get one ton of barrel anywhere in the world. I can't answer the why of this, but southwestern New Hampshire, uh, you know, the, the other side of the map that I was showing in this area of, of uh, and I, we did comment, I think, with you guys that you can't dig a hole in that area and not find barrel. Um, cannot answer why the numbers are as high as they are. But Barrel Mountain had 32% barrel. Wow. That was kept a secret for almost 60 years. It wasn't, it wasn't published in the government documents. So um, all of the mines in this area are up there, but Burrow Mountain is like off the charts. And I, I've been lecturing for quite some time now. I, I love doing this and I love you know, exploring this niche of unknown history. Um, but I was lecturing at the 50th anniversary of the Gilsum Rock Swap. It's like the major rock event that takes place. And this would have been five, six years ago. And in front of 250 people, you ever have the words fly out of your mouth and you like want to retract them with the fishing pole? <laughs> I say that Burrow Mountain is the greatest concentration of Burrow in the world. It's like, who the heck said that? Pull that back. I have no facts to back that up. And in five weeks, I had the proof. So I knew I was on the right um, path at, at unfolding this story. And um, it was Harvard University and Dartmouth that determined it was the greatest percentage of barrel in the world. Um, you can still go there today and get barrel. I'll bet it might be the smaller pieces. Um, but uh, again, for a, a geography that's so small, it's just like unheard of, okay? Now, as a kid, I grew up here. As a kid, we all just, you know, you went to hang out in the mines and look for rocks, and it was just in your head from, you don't even know where the thought originated, but you wanted to find barrel. That was the holy damn grail of going out and, and checking around, you know, looking around the mines. I had an affinity for Micah, so I always came home with Micah, and uh, Micah just doesn't get its uh, due share of respect, but um, I'm slowly changing that. So let's put this together. You've got a location with 32% barrel. Now, these, uh, the documents that I was studying for the government, um, there's the U.S. Geological Survey documents, and they would um, send out workers to analyze different things. So in the report that generated that was that generated the results about the 161 pegmatites, the guy was told, and he doesn't know why he's told, he's just told, at the end of every one of your summaries of the mine, we want to know how much barrel is on the discard piles. You've got to estimate it. So this is around 1915. Good 15 or more years before we have the, uh, well, almost 20 years before we had the extraction process for uh, getting beryllium out. So uh, I went through that document, and this is before I knew about the 32%, and it was like one ton here and a couple of tons there, and you know, specifically around this area, every discard pile had barrel. Like, it wasn't like, uh, uh, it, it's again, it's unusually blessed with the six 
grains of sand. And, uh, and again, we can't answer that question why. But the mineral beryl concentrates beryllium in that six to eight, eight to 12 percent of the beryllium oxide. And um, it does that, no other mineral does that, okay? And, and we're going to bring it around to some local mines here um, in a minute when I, when I tell you a little bit more. So, again, I'm trying to search for the exact number of years, but um, it was kept secret how many tons were on the discard <clears throat> pile at this location. Decades later, it came out that there was 26 tons. So take that and then multiply it times 300,000 pounds of hard rock mining that you'd have to do elsewhere to get 26 tons. It's like, you just go there, it's on the ground. <laughs> so, uh, the nuclear age begins, the extraction process for taking the barrel out of, uh, taking the beryllium out of the mineral barrel was conquered in 1937. And if you think about this from a perspective of what won World War II, um, it's, it's almost uncanny that for 200 years we've been trying to extract this stuff. We finally can extract it just a decade before we drop the first atomic bombs that end World War II. Um, now, the importance of that is not so great unless you know a little bit about beryllium and again, some of its phenomenal characteristics. It's a neutron multiplier. When I read some of this stuff, like, my head's got the comics, you know, the Disney comics, the Saturday morning ones, so I see that Jimmy Neutron guy there with his neutron neutralizer, and he can turn a proton beam into a neutron, well, excuse me, his device, because of beryllium, can turn a proton beam into a neutron beam, and if you shoot um, one neutron at beryllium, it returns 30. And that's the secret to the triggering of the atomic bomb. And uh, the shapes that the, the first bombs took is that they had a sphere over the high explosives that was a beryllium shell. And in the very center was the detonation that created the neutrons that went out, multiplied by 30, and then came back and ignited the um, high, high lens explosives. So, very critical role, um, but also perhaps very um, uh, demanding about the, the amount of beryllium, because otherwise in the rest of the world, you take 2% beryllium, you add it to copper, and you get a miracle copper. It doesn't take a lot of beryllium. But um, there were, uh, again, 90% of all electronics technological advances were only made in the last 50 years of the 20th century, so from 1950 on. And that equates with 1937, uh, Brush Wellman uh, got the, uh, had a crack. They were cracking the mineral down to get the beryllium out. And by 1952, um, anybody could call up and say, hey, FedEx me some beryllium and you'd have it the next day. Well, FedEx didn't exist back then, but you know what I mean. They could get it lickety split. Um, <laughs> There's a very interesting story. Um, Leslie Groves, uh, he, he became, I know his, uh, his rank changed, but anyway, Leslie Groves was put in charge of the Manhattan Project to create the atomic bombs. And there's two gentlemen that you, Probably, well, yeah, probably never heard of. The first one I think is really cool because he's basically just a kid and he learns that he can requisition anything through the military supply operations without his boss's approval. <laughs> so he's requisitioning pure beryllium metal and he's playing with it just for, what do you call that? <laughs> so he's on his maiden voyage in the Navy in a submarine 
just got on the boat for like, you know, months, going to be at sea, and Leslie Groh's research staff finds out that there was this kid playing with beryllium. They turned the sub around, brought it back to Virginia and took him off. And um, he worked with the likes of Einstein and other such people. The other, the other gentleman is Bob, Bob Thurman. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Bob Thurman was Leslie Grove's um, number three man, and he built the Pentagon. Uh, he oversaw the project of building the Pentagon, and he delivered it faster and cheaper than anybody could have possibly imagined. And when Groves was put in charge, Bob Thurman was right behind me. I'm sorry. I get a little bit emotional thinking about this. So Bob Thurman went down, went to his death in 2008 without ever telling anybody what he did. In the article I read, he was the greatest spy America had ever produced since the revolution, and nobody knows about him. He's called the mysterious major when you see the picture of the plane that delivered the atomic bombs. He's standing right in the middle. Nobody knew his name ever until 2008. Secrecy is uh, key to the wrapping this up with getting to modern times and the Cold War. Um, without a doubt in my mind, the barrel necessary for the three first three atomic bombs came from Burrow Mountain. I mean, it's just boom, 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 I can see it. Right after that, Burrow Mountain had armed guards. 24-7, I've interviewed the family that had, the descendants of the family that had the job to provide that armed guard services. Again, elevating it to this level of, uh, we didn't want other people to know how good we had it. So, um, the Cold War be ensues 45 years of Cold War. The greatest death toll in the Cold War was um, Department of Defense workers uh, and any of the workers that worked with beryllium. Mm -hmm. And um, we're talking about you know the, the front lines of, of, of manufacturing those shields and and uh, and whatever else that they were. Uh, the government was playing with beryllium in all sorts of ways that we may never know. So, um, I got two things to tell you and I want to make sure I know which way to go. Oh. <clears throat> well, the, the, uh, I don't know. Oh, hey. There may be some here that don't know the history of the Cold War, so I'm just going to say you know, it was it was Russia, the atomic arms race between Russia and the United States, and it wasn't in, again until 2008 or somewhere around there that the Brookings Institute that does all the research and tells us after the fact what went on 50 years ago, the Brookings Institute. Um, put out when the greatest number of nuclear warheads were in active deployment for the United States. Um, and I know you could all guess years, but it doesn't matter, I'm going to tell you, it was in the 60s. In 1968, 68 is when the U.S. could say, nah, 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 we got way more than you. And it was the beginning of a long ending to the Cold War, it didn't end right away. But how did they, how did we excel ahead in the production? Because we were buying barrel from anywhere in the world. I mean, I have pictures of the U.S. government defense stockpile of barrel. It's not just Barrel Mountain. There are 
pulling it in from wherever they could, and Russia's doing the same, and they're both frantically looking for other minerals that can do the same. And that's, I said I'd bring that back around, and um, right here, uh, just down any mine, but it's called Lime Quarry, it's right down 110, uh, well, that way, um, towards Chelmsford. And uh, again, this particular document that I, I have the whole, whole document, but I'll just tell you about this one. They looked at every single mineral that could be found in that mine and what percentage of beryllium was in it. And it was like trace, nothing, 0.2%. It was just, no other mineral aggregates beryl like the beryllium like beryl, but beryl did go obsolete. Okay, in the 1970s, but I'm going to stick with the end of the World War II first. So, the U.S. government needs more ber uh, beryllium, and we just lost uh, John F. Kennedy. And those, those that make such decisions decided to build a Kennedy building in Boston. 14 stories, and it was going to house all of the um, uh, government, federal government workers that were in multiple locations into this one complex. And the architects decide that they're going to put courts on the outside of the building. This is a bag of white snow courts. And um, it's all a rouge. They know they want to mine Barrel Mountain. They need a reason to mine Barrel Mountain. Because there's more barrel. They go out on contract to multiple mines. They make it all look good that they're actually we're going to get the quartz from someplace <coughs> else. But no, they were coming here. So Carl Thomas got the contract. I think I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, rusty on whether it was eight months or 18 months. No, it was eight months and nine men. They mined 26 tons. Exact same number. In that short period of time. While they were taking out the courts, all this barrel was coming out, and that was being sold off to the defense contractor. So that's uh, one, we, we sell these little bags of uh, the white quartz. Um, you can feel it. One of the unique features of Barrel Mountain, uh, which it has so many unique features, is that the, um, the quartz has a texture, a feel. So if you pick up these little white ones that you can touch here, you can feel that it's, it's called druzy. There's teeny little, teeny little um, crystals on it that you can't see, but it's a hallmark. You know, if somebody says, well, the rose quartz, it doesn't feel that way, but any of the... the the uh, um, snow quartz, milky quartz, a lot of names for it. But anyway, so they took the quartz and they shipped it off uh, to Newport, New Hampshire, and they uh, put it onto Portland cement, and those became the sides for this uh, building. But again, it was, it was years for me to figure out, and I didn't have any proof that barrel came out during that operation until I'm in Ackworth and there's um, like a, like a, uh, this is a, a Westford uh, Historical Society. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of historical people were selling up at the top of the hill on the common. I don't, I don't remember, oh, maybe it was the, uh, like the uh, anniversary of the town. And so this one woman came over and told me how her uh, husband worked in the mines. And, um, and then I just said to her, I said, do you have anything that talks to you? And it, I learned she had a booth. And this again, as an older woman, she had a booth and that she had books and things of her husband's that she was selling. And I said, well, do you have anything that talks about Barrel Mountain or Barrel? I'd be interested. And her grand nephew came over and gave me a document that told me the exact number. It, it was written in the like Rocks and Gem magazine, if, if you're not familiar with this, but there's certain magazines where the articles are so well written, they give the people's names, the places, who did this, who did that. It was that kind of article. 
Um, so uh, very, um, very ama well, amazing to me that um, that this additional 26 tons uh, so easily came out of the uh, of the location. Now. Let's talk about the downside of, um, of the, the powder and the, 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 uh, the casualties, the human casualties during the Cold War. So if you, this is how, again, right out of the government documents, this is the example they gave. They said, sharpen a pencil, break off the lead. So you got this teeny little piece of lead. Grind it up, spread it out over an entire football field of air six feet thick. Breathe it and you're dead. <laughs> Greatest medical enigma in the history of the 20th century is beryllium and beryliosis because three of us, let's say three of us were in the, the Navy and in the early days, they, uh, an aircraft carrier, right? A plane has to land really quick and they got to jam on the brakes Beryllium was the only thing that could take the heat away in that shorter period of time because of its heat dissipation abilities. So let's say that uh, you know three of us had the same job of putting that uh, rubber um, triangle under the under the uh, the wheels, and then you're securing the plane. So we're breathing in that dust. I die in five years. You're right next to me. You die 20 years, and you were there, and you die 40 years later. We're all gonna die of beryliosis, which means that you you suffocate to death. Your breath gets taken away. Nasty, nasty way to go. But that's how little. So the companies making beryllium for the arms race, the stories of the wife washing her husband's clothes and she dies of beryliosis, just a little girl playing in the street. The government covered it up for 30 plus years. They delayed the onset of OSHA, things that we have today, occupational safety and health standards. Um, they snowballed it. And that's a whole other side to the story. I just wanted to at least get a, po get a point. In the items that we touch every day, it's not powder anymore. And if you touch barrel, the mineral, you're not going to get hurt by it. You could chew on this and suck on it. And I don't know what it would take, but it might take a lot more. But again, the enigma of beryliosis is how it affects every human different. And of course, if somebody lived 45 years, they're going to have some other um, ailments. But uh, 1999, this story was uh, broken by the Toledo Blade because a young gentleman went to work, they told him he was totally safe, and he was dead in two years. And the investigative reporters got into this and started to do the research. They, um, this plant at this time, uh, Toledo, it was just, just outside um, in Ohio, uh, they shut down the plant, and if you look at the production of beryllium, there was five years of zero production of beryllium, and the plant re reappeared out in Utah in the middle of the Seaver Desert. And there's like nine employees and the rest are robots, all funded by the government for the processing of beryllium. Um, and the other thing that's uh, amazing is this is in the Seaver Desert. So if you have Provo, a Salt Lake City, Provo, and then Delta, Utah, Delta. This is out in the Seaver Desert. It's called the Topaz Mountains. Um, they found that, they finally found that one mineral that could give beryllium without it being beryl. They can strip mine it like coal. So they can just, but it only has one to two percent beryllium. But that's like light years ahead of all the other minerals that they assess. Um, you can't see the scars. I have pictures, uh, Google Earth pictures. They've taken them away. The company has 7,500 acres of access to federal lands for the extraction of bertrandite. Bertrandite is the new mineral that has uh, supplanted barrel. 
um, in its use. So, I, left, I know I left one or two other things off and I can open it for questions. Oh, so modern times. I mentioned that that space hammer was like really expensive. Now, I don't know if it was need, ever needed to be pure beryllium or not. The, 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 the government never talks about what they use for beryllium. It's all top secret. So the greatest um, thing that we can all uh, imagine is the, the new space telescope. All right, so that's what the picture is here. Hopefully, you know, people know, know or have seen what it looks like. And it looks like there's these giant gold honeycombs, right? For that's the, that's the mirrors that are looking back in time. All of that gold is the size of a golf ball. Those mirrors are pure beryllium. It was the most expensive, and it was for all the delays of that thing was amassing enough beryllium to build it. The solid beryllium. With a little, and, and that made this telescope so, so many times bigger than the Hubble, but thousands of pounds less in payload capacity to get it off the ground. So uh, that's the most amazing uh, use of, of beryllium. Um, the 70s, I don't know. I, I don't have to go back and pull that other fact out. So if, if you like this talk, I, I, we have, there's a, this is a, a, a smidgen of the talk I give called The Secret Life of Beryl. Um, I give lectures on about uh, 13 different mineral topics. So th these were the sheets that advertise today, but it's got my contact information. So I don't have business cards, so if you'd like contact information, you can either jot it down. And these are out on, um, in the hallway here, uh, up top. If you uh, like the idea of, of uh, well, I haven't told you a whole lot about our museum and its mission. Our mission is to educate people about minerals uh, throughout New England. And um, if you want to take one of these, uh, this is all about mica. And these are actual things that are in the museum um, that are very unique. And I realized today when I was bringing these to hand to you that I need one on barrel. <laughs> so, but feel free to take Micah. At the bottom, it tells you how you can access all of the museum online. Um, we have our own Google search results page. You have to use quotes, otherwise you start seeing sheep. Cora means sheep. You didn't do it right. Get the quotes around. But Cora is Micah Mine Schoolhouse and you can find all sorts of things that we do and, and report. Oh, yeah. Wow. I almost missed this over here. So that's my shameless schmoozing. And um, you know, I, I, I have full length articles uh, that you can access that way. Uh, this is the Eagle Times, and it's, it was called, uh, it's about Beryl, if you'd like to learn more. And this very unusual locality, I've kind of been the de facto uh, steward of Beryl Mountain. Well, that's another story as to how I got into that. But um, what's shown on this table, and I'll, I'll hold them up in order of... Burrow Mountain is still producing brand new finds. These are, these are three mineral finds that are unique to Barrow Mountain, that are not in the history books, um, that I'm still in the process of getting certified. Um, this particular one is pretty simple. It's, uh, it's called scapolite, and, uh, but it's not in the normal list of minerals. And this is a long wave, this is a faceted piece in here. Uh, let me just hold it on this. The long, long wave <coughs> ultraviolet light. Scapolite is extremely UV reactive, which is how we found it. And it's actually a version called Warnerite, but they don't recognize Warnerite. Warnerite was the super fluorescent example of scapolite. So this was found about three, four years ago. I take people on tours to Barrow Mountain. I show you how to find this. Um, the second one that we found, um, that, that's brand, that I found, is brand new. It's, uh, we're calling it mosaic mica. Normally mica makes books like you would see in this display case here, but this is mica that was created under extreme heat and pressure 
Up against the very top of Burrow Mountain was five to eight feet of pure quartz. And this is formed right underneath it. And basically the mica comes out in these beautiful patchworks. Again, you can feel free to pick this up over here. Um, this biotite mica or, or the black mica on the back. Um, that's just a, a phenomenal specimen. And then this year, um, I had always, I focused on the, um, I like golden barrel. So when I go there, I'm always looking for this color. But I'm finding a lot of other things. That's how I found the scapolite. And there's a ton of rusty quartz. You know what rusty quartz is? It's white or clear quartz, but it's just got a rust coating over it. There's a gobs of that up there. And there's other minerals of the same color that I'm not getting into. So I had collected a whole lot of what I thought was this beautiful golden barrel color. And this was collected on uh, one of my uh, mineral tours. Um, must have been in the spring of this year. I don't remember the exact date. And the gentleman that collected it is, is a fellow friend and collector of mine, Len, um, but he's from the North Shore of Massachusetts. And just seeing this unbelievable um, kind of right angle tipped off people that this is a, 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 a never before known mineral occurrence. And it's golden barrel that was fused into the quartz again with heat and pressure so that the golden barrel no longer has its shape, but it's fused in these lines and, and the, 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 the right angle is what gave it away. So um, this is being analyzed now by uh, things called ramen that uh, can, can look at it. So that's what you got there. Uh, I feel like I left one key thing out. What time are we? 2.30. Well, that went faster than I thought. You did. <laughs> okay. Well, gives us plenty of time for questions. Now I'm going to come close so I can hear. Oh, uh, you were talking about Mr. Gro Groveland. Was that the person yes. you were talking about? Now, did he just as a hobbyist or something, get interested in beryllium? The, the what Tom, was the, story the, the, the gentleman whose name was Tom, yes, it was just, just a hobby, but he was in the military, and that's why he was able to get access. <coughs> he was one of the ones that, that, that ended up um, uh, working on how do we use this neutron multiplication to trigger the, the atomic bomb. Yeah, no. But, you know, I mean, this is like a 19-year-old kid talking about somebody gets thrown right into the, the front of things. Yeah, but he isn't the person who was... Uh, oh, Furman? No, no. Oh, Gro wasn't there a Groveland that ran the atomic energy? No, General it? Groves was the head of the Manhattan Project, I believe. Yeah, Le Leslie, Leslie, right? Leslie Groves. Yeah, the Groves didn't have any... There might... There, 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 I, I, I did get some confusion over, over his name, and, and there, there obviously could have been multiple people at different levels. But uh, there were you know, hundreds of people involved. It wasn't like this one guy you know, made the decision all by himself. But so um, the, doing the lectures, uh, this is now... I don't know how old the Barrel Lecture... It's one of my oldest lectures, so let's say it's five, seven years old. When I do them, I meet all sorts of people that are really kind of cool. So at one of the lectures, I held up like a, um, a bowl, and, and I said, well, the, the, the beryllium shield is kind of like this bowl, and if you put the two halves together, you know, it reflected. This guy comes running up to me after the presentation. And the killer is that sometimes they don't, they're so excited, but they don't always tell me exactly why they're running after me. <laughs> and anyway, he goes, they're not shaped like that. They're not shaped like that. And I'm like, what? They're not shaped like a bowl. It's more like a teacup saucer. And I'm like, wow. Mm. So in the original fat man, they were like a bowl. But when you want to put a detonator in a torpedo, it's like a tea sauce, sauce. <laughs> and, and, and then he tells me why. He makes these at General Electric on the North Shore of Massachusetts. And he wears one of those silver suits like you see the guys in the volcanoes. 
and there's three guys keeping it, keeping whatever size that he's working on, cherry red hot from behind, and he's shaping it with his tool from the front in one of those heat suits. Oh my God. So I've met so many people that have had amazing jobs that, again, we don't, you know, you, you, you're not going to see his expose on the, the Dirty Job Show or something. <laughs> Did you get one for the museum, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> like the, 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 the beryllium copper here is donated from one such person. He, work, he, he, he uh, works in the high tech just west of us. And um, he was in my lecture and he sent me a nice little bag of, of uh, the certified beryllium copper. So um, it, 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 the lecture has come together over this five year period. To me, this was the coolest place to deliver it. I hope you really enjoyed it because, you know, I, I, I had, you have all the things to sort of see. And believe it or not, are there any, any of Carl's descendants with us today? All right. There, there, there might, might have been. And, um, but Carl's left Barrel Mountain to his daughter and um, son. Mm -hmm. And none of them are interested in the history. They don't care about it. They don't want to know about it. They don't want to attend a lecture about it. It's just like it was just work for them. Okay, it was just a place to work. So um, the Barrel Mountain is going to change hands. I was told this again two weeks ago. We don't know when, and uh, so it's a free for all for me to be able to bring people there until it gets posted, which is what will happen. So. Um, we're going to run at least, I'm trying to run at least six tours there over the next several months. Now, how do you find out about that? The best thing is if, if you're Facebook or social media is to follow Mike and Mine Schoolhouse because that's where the events are created and would be posted. Um, I also have never been very good at sharing with uh, the, 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 uh, my following or the world as to how my tours get booked. And um, I do them all over New England. Our newest Elizabeth mine is going to be taking my time, which is up in, in, in Vermont. And um, I'm now starting to do archaic man and megalithic site tours. So I'm going to be fewer, fewer between. But if you have a, I know there are some members of a mineral club here. Uh, and if there's others, uh, you have a club and you would like to go, that's how a tour gets done. Somebody picks up the phone and says, hey, I want to go. We were talking with your family about, you know, if you can get me six to eight people that are willing to pay to go, then I'll go get another six to eight people and we can have a tour. So that's how the tours come up. It's, it's people ask for them. Um, and uh, so Barrel Mountain, you get the history on site, but you can also collect for minerals. You get to see uh, everything that is uh, obtainable. I bring boards and show just what, what we found there before. And, um, and then I'm on site to give you... Uh... Now, last thing I want to say about me. I'm not a rock hound, okay? I'd love to be a rock hound. But because I'm not one, I bring rock hounds with me so I can watch them. <laughs> now, it's amazing because we use this term lightly, especially within mineral clubs and, and you know, people of all ages. But I'm going to talk about some little people that I've taken out there. And the exact same group, these are maybe homeschool groups, so whatever age you want to imagine, I, I, I'm guessing, um, is one boy brings me nothing but r r r rusty quartz. Time and time and time again. Rusty quartz and rusty quartz, exact same thing, just different sizes and configuration. This other girl, platinum blonde hair, I don't know if that leads to her intelligence, she found everything that was on my display board, one at a time. <laughs> Holy mackerel, was I blown away. It just, so anyway, I enjoy doing this for that one fact alone. I love to work with kids and, and uh, kids of all ages. So um, again, if you, if you, if you, there are, uh, some items for sale. I have some of the bags of the quartz. I have some small tumbled quartz, which means it's from 
five miles away from Barrel Mountain. I have some little quartz, uh, I'm sorry, barrel pieces, small, on a card, but they're like five bucks a piece. Um, those are from Barrel Mountain. And then there's um, a little dirt bag. And the dirt bag definitely has golden, golden quartz, golden barrel, small pieces. Golden barrel, the aquamarine barrel, definitely has beautiful snow quartz and rock quartz. And then who knows what, because it's in with a bunch of the rest of the, 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 the minerals. Oh, uh, does the medical profession know why powdered beryllium is, is a health hazard? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite catching it. Oh. Does the medical profession know why powdered beryllium is a poison? That's, that's a, that's, no. I, 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 of all the research I've done, which is a ton, I've got thousands of pages of government documents to back this up. But I, I, I just, I, I have not, I've gone on to research some other things now. So, but he's asking about, you know, the, does the, you know, at some point, yeah, the medical community's got to try, got to finally figure out this enigma of, of how, how beryllium does what it does. Um, but uh, in, in, in 1999, I mentioned the Toledo Blade did the expose in 2000. That is a newspaper? Yeah, the newspaper, but then in 2000, um, 60 minutes? did a show called The Dust That Can Take Your Breath Away. Okay. And that's what cl closed the plant. It wasn't just, the newspaper wasn't enough. But when, uh, when, when that, that, and you, you can find those on YouTube. And, uh, but no, I haven't researched it, so don't know. Okay. 